Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Meet Kevin Show. Today, we are talking to a bean butcher, and not just any butch, uh, bean butcher, but Mitchell Scott, the CEO and co-founder of The Very Good Food Butcher. I'm super excited to have Mitchell come on and uh, explain what is it that y'all do, what makes y'all special, what makes you tick, and where the heck are you? <laughs> Kevin, thanks so much for having me on the show. Um, Right now, I'm just in Vancouver at our new production facility, just in the uh, the warehouse. Uh, and yeah, I'm excited to be on the show and uh, really looking forward to it. Thank you so much. So you make meats that are plant-based. And uh, I, I've gone through the ingredients labels. Mm. I've tried some. I've ordered some of your food. I've tried mm. some of it. Uh, it. It seems like the way you do it is... Uh, with with wheat glutens as, as something to keep basically the beans together because when I think of beans and cooked beans they can kind of fall apart is is that mm -hmm. how you do it like wheat glutens kind of keeping together beans and then you shape it like it's meat and then it, then you have plant based meat is is that about right Yeah, for the most part, I mean we're that's our kind of where our, our core product range came from. Uh, mm -hmm. So the idea of of a a vegan butcher shop. So we're taking beans, veggies, herbs, and spices. And then the wheat gluten to kind of bind it together, give it that texture and taste, um, and then shaping it. Yeah, so we're not just doing burgers and sausages. We're doing ribs, steaks, pepperonis, basically having that full lineup of kind of high-quality artisanal meat alternatives. Um, we are working on a gluten-free line as well uh, as a few other projects. Um, but, yeah, that's that's essentially it. It, it is a lot of uh, many steps in the process to, to take it from, from bean to burger, I guess. Yeah, um, can you but, can you give like a brief overview of that? That's so fascinating. I mean, I mean, how how do you go from okay, we got herbs, we got beans, and we got some wheat gluten in the wheat line, yeah. right? We'll talk about the gluten free line in a moment. Mm -hmm. But how do you go from that to here's mm -hmm. your hot dog or your steak? Absolutely. So I'll talk about how we're doing it in Victoria, which is a still a smaller scale production facility. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this the space here in Vancouver has a, a lot of you know much bigger equip, equipment doing things at a larger scale. Um, but I mean, it starts off, you got to boil your beans. You can't have a, you know, a, I guess a half baked bean. Uh, so boil the beans um, and then it gets basically chop all the, all the fresh veggies. So we're using real, you know, fresh vegetables, not no dried veggies or anything. Chop all the veggies, put it in a big tilt, tilt uh, skillet, basically a giant frying pan. So that gets cooked for, you know, 45 minutes or so. That's when we're adding all the herbs, the spices, the flavoring. Uh, then we grind that all up until it's kind of like a soup almost. We call it, we call it a mix. Um, mix gets cooled down, put in a big mixer, we add the wheat gluten, then it turns into kind of a dough. Uh, and then depending on the product, that dough then gets shaped. So burgers, it goes through this burger press we have, sausages, pepperoni, it goes into a stuffer. Once it's gone through that process, it's got its shape, it goes in a big steaming oven for about an hour, comes out, it's chilled, packaged, sealed with care, and uh, shipped off uh, around North America. It's incredible. So it, it, when I think of dough, I think of yeast and dough rising. When, when you put it in the oven, it, it doesn't rise. It, it just, it's because there's no yeast, I imagine, or mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe clarify that part there. There's a, there's no rising. I mean, in the sausage casing, it expands a little bit, gets mm. a bit bigger, but we, we keep it kind of constricted. Uh, so it gets a little bit bigger, but not like, you know, you leave the bread uncovered and next thing you know, it's, you know, taken over your kitchen. Gotcha. Now, from most of the ingredients I've looked at that you have, most of them are, are pretty pure. Are you using uh, any any kind of um, uh, like sunflower oils or like what kind of oils do you generally mm. use? Not, not that one is better than the other, but I guess I'm just curious what kind of oils maybe go into the products. Yeah. So we use sunflower oil, mm -hmm. uh, non-GMO sunflower oil for the most sure. part. Um, we've experimented with you know a number of different oils. Um, but yeah, it's really trying to keep as clean an ingredient profile as possible, good nutritionals. Uh, and just create, you know, healthy, tasty food. Gotcha. And and how does that uh, that work? Is it generally are you looking for oils that can withstand that higher heat, or is there like a benefit of 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 using a sunflower oil versus something that maybe is like a canola oil? Yeah. So that's my my uh, co-founder James. He's a chef. He's really involved in the the recipe development process. And I think, yeah, I mean, with canola, there's a lot of kind of negative connotations over the years. That's one of the reasons we're using sunflower instead. Mm. Um, but in terms of like cooking properties, it, it doesn't really matter because it's all kind of baked in. It's not like we're we're frying something and needing to reach a specific temperature. Sure. Um, and we're we're trying to add as little oil as possible, but you still need to add some when you're when you're cooking these. Of course, you're, of you're course. Frying, yeah. frying the veggies, yeah. Make sure they don't all stick to the pan. You got to have some oil. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's awesome. So you, you're expanding. Uh, and is, is 
having gone public, one of the ways that you've been able to expand to another facility, or maybe can you touch yeah. on that process a little bit because you've got the the one facility in uh, Victoria, I think you said, yeah. and now you're you're in Vancouver. Yeah. So yeah, I guess we went public ten months or so ago. Uh, at the time, we, I mean, still to this day, we had you know quality product, a uh, ton of demand for it in grocery stores online. Just can't make enough product. That's basically been our problem since day one. So currently we've got this, it's an old bakery in Victoria, which packed to the seams with, you know, people with equipment. We've got, we, need to upgrade, we can't upgrade our power there. Like we're, we're really making the most use of this space. Um, we actually did our first million dollar month the other month. And that was just from this Vic, little Victoria production facility, which was pretty incredible. Um, anyways, we knew we needed to go find a bigger space. Uh, and we found this space in Vancouver. It was actually the old day of foods uh, manufacturing facility. Uh, so they're the largest, you know, one of the largest plant-based cheese makers in the world. Uh, so they were moving out and we were ready to move in. Um, so the nice thing is it was kind of ready for food production. We just had to get in here, kind of fix it up a little bit and put in equipment. Uh, so yeah, we took possession January 15th and we're getting it started up, you know, as I'm speaking uh, and really kind of increasing our production so that we can start meeting this, this pent up demand for our products. Gosh, yeah. Now, now what, how, how are you finding uh, demand shifts uh, with these mm. changes in COVID? I imagine you had a spike. Are you seeing that pull back down? What's mm. what's the website analytics and uh, you yeah. know, product analytics look like? Yeah. Yeah. So at the start of COVID, we had kind of three main areas of business. Um, mm. So we had our actually in Victoria, we have a, a brick and mortar retail butcher shop. Uh, so we were selling product directly to people. Uh, oh, we wow. had a rest, we had a restaurant attached to that. Uh, and at the time it was a decent chunk of our revenue. Uh, we also had online sales. We, we were very early into online. Um, I want to say like six months after we opened. So back in 2017, we opened our online store. So that was all set up running nicely, kind of, you know, working, there's, you know, logistical challenges with shipping refrigerated products, but we were getting through them. Uh, and then the third channel was grocery store. So, you know, grocery stores, restaurants, et cetera. Um, and it, what was interesting is they, the three kind of shifted. So obviously restaurants went downhill. Uh, yeah. we, we, you know, we, we pivoted to skip the dishes and, and DoorDash, uh, reduced our opening hours, but then the other two just went like, up. so like online sales really took off, uh, cause we had that infrastructure in place. We could just kind of scale things up, uh, grocery store. There was that massive, like, you know, everywhere's out of toilet paper and, and groceries and, you know, more people are eating from home. Uh, so those are really sales have, have remained strong. Uh, the restaurant has kind of recovered a bit and then dipped again when they, when they put more restrictions in place. Um, but at the same time, we've been expanding our production capacity out of Victoria. So we, we've really been able to lean into that and just keep scaling and growing. Now, uh, why go public? Did, did that, uh, as opposed to maybe getting like venture capital financing, I mean, it sounds mm. like you went from like local restaurant and butcher shop uh, attached to the restaurant to here you are, public company. I mean, a, as of uh, the last like Bloomberg update here, a uh, market cap of like 449 million uh, mm -hmm. Canadian dollars. Yeah. So do you, do you have time for a quick little story, right? Sure. Yeah. So ba I mean, basically I was, I was in fundraising mode for about six months to a year. I was going to pitch events. I was talking to venture capitalists. I was seeing what was out there. You know, we'd, we'd done a, a small uh, equity crowdfunding on a platform called Front Funder. So we were scaling up, but we needed to raise some more money. Um, yeah. And I was actually de delivering our holiday, our holiday roast. It's called a stuffed beast. It's like a, a turkey almost uh, delivered to this super nice house in Vancouver. And, and the guy in there was a customer and a fan. Uh, and he was like, you know, have you, you know, what's the plans for the company? What do you want to do? And his whole thing was he didn't like investing in private companies because he was still invested in some from 20 years ago. Uh, oh. So his, no his liquidity. Push was, yeah, no liquidity, right? Uh, so his push was like him and a few friends will put in a bit, you know, just under two million bucks, help scale up the company, professionalize it with the goal of, of taking it public on the the, the CSE. Um, and so at the time, we like a lot of back and forth, you know, a lot of opinions all over the place on whether it's the right route or not. It's definitely not the traditional route for a small food startup. Uh, at the end of the day, we looked at the offers on the table. We had a few term sheets from VCs. Um, and we decided to go with the go public route. I mean, Beyond Meat had gone public a few months pr prior. There was a ton of retail interest. Uh, the, the VC offers we were looking at were like, we'd be giving up a ton of control. Um, mm. So, I mean, we decided to go for it. It was quite the process. Like, e like it went, but we went, even for our audit, we went back to like our first year in business, which was, you know, kind of shoebox accounting for us. Uh, sure. But got through it all. We're ready to go, you know, February, March of last year. And then, of course, I'm sure you know what happened. COVID hit. Markets yeah. tanked and we're like, oh no. Um, so I mean, yeah, we I mean we got through it, we put, 
pivoted the business. Um, and then we were able to go public a few months after that. And it really just took off, I think, driven by a really strong, you know, retail demand. I mean, we've been growing a, a brand and a community for, you know, four years. We had a lot of really loyal supporters. And I think a lot of them were like, I'm going to invest in this company now. And that really, I think, helped fuel our initial kind of spurt, I guess. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, because you had a, an incredible IPO debut. I think you were up like, what, 800% when you first opened or something incredible? Yeah. So we we um, we um IPO'd at 25 cents a share. It kind of shot up to 250, settled into the dollar fifty to two range for, you know, a couple months. We raised some additional money um, and then it took off you know, up to nine and it's, you know, it's, it's settled, uh, sure. which is, which is great. And and I think what we're really doing is trying to to grow into that valuation uh, and to kind of expand all, cause I mean, the demand for our products there, we really just need to execute and start filling that demand. And there's no mm. way we're going to be able to do it out of that Victoria facility that was already, you know, at the seams. That makes sense. Now you compared yourself to Beyond Meat or at least uh, when Beyond Meat was going public. Uh, how does your product compare to Beyond Meat? Yeah, good question. Um, I think we're we're going for a cleaner cleaner ingredient deck, uh, better nutritionals. I think we're kind of, I guess, trying to position ourselves in that that premium space. Um, whereas I think Beyond's going a bit more mass market. Like they'll be available, you know, like Carl Juniors and McDonald's and that. Uh, so we're really trying to take that butcher shop aesthetic, focus on good ingredients, focus on artisanal uh, and just high quality products. Uh, I mean, I think I think their product is great. I think it's creating a ton of new customers for us. You know, with all their advertising and marketing, they're getting everyone to try plant-based because you know yeah. so many people ha have a negative connotation. Like, you know, I grew up vegetarian. I had so many bad veggie burgers over a twenty-year period, and I'm sure you know many people have had a similar experience. So they go out and have a Beyond Burger, and they're like, "Wow, plant-based food is great. I'm going to try some more of this." And they're not going to eat a Beyond Burger every single day for well, I mean, they might. They're they're pretty good burgers, but yeah. uh, they're going to try other stuff. They're going to look for what else is out there. What you know, what what different types of products can I try? So. Yeah, that's kind of my my thought on competition, and I mean, I think that mm. as I'm sure you're aware, the market is growing like crazy, um, and it's really yeah, it's really it's really fun. Now, uh, this uh, reference to older veggie products. When I think of older veggie products, I can't help but think of soy based uh, mm. meats. Is is that different today? Because I saw some of your ingredients were like black beans. And, uh, can you talk to that or about that a little bit? Yeah, there's been a few different variations of you know veggie burger 1.0 2.0 there was that one i used to get that you put in the toaster to cook it or something yeah which was interesting uh, yeah a lot of them were very soy heavy so we don't use any soy um okay. our current product lineup it's called seitan uh and that just means it's got it's wheat gluten but we're using a lot of veggies in it without it trying to make like a veggie burger it still looks mm. and tastes meaty it doesn't yeah. look like a, a a mushy blend of vegetables. And that's because we're adding this weak gluten and creating that texture uh, through this process. Gotcha. Um, so how are you going to do a, a, a gluten free version then? Because obviously mm -hmm. any of these, these kinds of wheats that you're using, you're going to have gluten, uh, gluten, butcher that one. You're going to have uh, gluten in them. So, I mean, even if you used, uh, I imagine rye or some of these other products, it's all gluten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our R and D team has been just evaluating other protein sources. So how can we make something that's gluten free, but that still remains true to our kind of core ethos of, yeah. of cleaning of ingredients you can pronounce and understand? Uh, so you know, a lot of companies will use like a pea protein. We've evaluated a number of different ones, like fava beans. Uh, but uh, yeah, at the end of the day, you do have to bring some food technology in there, and it's that that line between a chemical. A bunch of chemicals pushed together into something you know probably pretty good but and then you know that just just finding that balance uh, and that's something we're, we're working really hard on yeah yeah exactly no that, that and that makes sense how big of a market is that gluten market i mean is it one that's a is, is it a priority is it is it necessary mm -hmm. to focus on or can you just go to town on on focusing just on these meat products that you've got right now okay they got gluten but they're mm -hmm. great yeah, we absolutely can. I mean, it's and it's even in some grocery store reports, it's broken down into a separate category called Satan. It's still growing at, you know, 20 percent plus. Uh, but for us, it's about accessibility as well. So one of our big customer requests has been a gluten free line. You know, there's a lot of mm -hmm. vegans and gluten free people. Uh, so we're, we're doing it to serve a customer need. And at the same time, I think we can we can come up with something pretty, pretty unique and interesting. Uh, that being said, I still think there's a huge market for our existing product lineup. And we're continuing to expand that product lineup and get it out there. Gotcha. Well, how important is having a variety of products versus just 
being very, very proficient mm -hmm. in maybe your, your top sellers? I think for us and trying to be this, this butcher shop with a selection, I think it's really important. Uh, and I think what you found is so, you know, Beyond Meat came out with the Beyond Burger. And yeah. then, you know, th six months later, there's about five Beyond Burger clones on the market. You know, Nestle comes out with one, this grocery store, that grocery store. All of a sudden, there's five of them and they all, they're kind of sim same ingredients. They kind of reverse engineer them. Um, and obviously, the so I, I guess that's for us, having a diverse portfolio of products is part of what makes us different. And I think mm -hmm. makes it harder because are they going to copy 10 or 15 different products and then give them the shelf space and do that whole thing not as likely as saying okay this is a hip product and then let's just copy that right and i imagine at this point you've kind of left the idea of a restaurant behind and it's really become let's focus on e-commerce and just selling this online huh yeah so i mean for us we see the restaurant butcher shop as basically a marketing branding tool so the kind of flagship store concept uh so once we get out of covid like we want to open up 20 of these around the world oh wow. um so, you know, go over, open one up, you know, London, Tokyo, Montreal, Toronto. I don't know, I don't know where you are. We'll open one up there. Um, <laughs> but basically just kind of showcase the brand, show off the products, show that plant-based eating is approachable, delicious. Yes, they make enough money to kind of cover their upkeep and, and maybe make a bit. But yeah, we don't want to be in the, the restaurant owning game, but we think it's an incredible tool for getting our product out there, for setting us apart from the competitors uh, and to really kind of supporting, like they support our, our e-commerce efforts, they support our grocery store efforts. Um, like when we, when we first launched this, uh, in Victoria, I think 2017, um, winter, we had about a thousand people show up on our opening day, just cause Come this on. idea of a, a vegan, we had to shut down for a week after that. Just this idea of a vegan butcher shop is like, that's different. Uh, and there was like some back and forth on a local Facebook page with, you know, some angry carnivores being like, you can't call it a butcher shop. There's, you know, no meat there. And then, so <laughs> it just creates a bit of controversy, uh, which is I think great, great for business. No press is bad press. So uh, yeah. you can, I guess, uh, to to separate that, uh, vegan can include gluten because obviously vegans can can eat bread. So separating, mm -hmm. you get vegan and gluten free. I just want to make sure I got that right, right? Yeah, you got it right. Okay, and okay, I think okay. what's what's getting confusing now though is mm -hmm. there's also plant based, and companies are slapping plant based on everything because it makes it it sell better. But mm -hmm. like what what I, I see vegan and plant based being very similar, meaning okay. no animal products. But some companies will slap a plant based on there, but there'll be there'll be cheese or egg or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's I see. But the, yeah, the gluten free yeah gluten free and vegan is is yeah compatible, I guess. Have you noticed any uh, competition with the uh, with the company Tattooed Chef? Yeah, I'm familiar with the company. Um, mm -hmm. More just so from I guess the the investing world. Um, I think they're in a different category from us. I mean, they're in the States, they're in the, they're in the frozen meal segment for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, yeah, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I've noticed any, any competition, but I'm kind of aware of what they're doing just from a few kind of, you know, investor groups, I guess. Gotcha. I, I, saw yeah. your, I saw your, I saw your video on it as well. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay. So on, on, uh, back to very, I wanted to uh, ask you about margins. What, what are your expectations? Because, uh, you know, right now, obviously you're growing, so you're not profitable yet. Have you already mm -hmm. forecast profitability and, and, uh, what do you think margins will look like? Yeah. So we haven't really put anything out to the market. I mean, a lot of it is changing as we get into this new manufacturing facility here. Sure. Uh, it also depends on channel, right? Like we sell directly to consumer on e-commerce, we're getting 70% or something, right? It's just how much it costs to produce, right? Um, yeah. So that's, which is great, but then, you know, you can't sell all your stuff direct to consumer and sometimes there's acquisition costs and uh, and then, you know, grocery store, there's the distributors, the brokers, the retailers. Um, so yeah, we haven't, I don't, we haven't put anything out. Um, I think our, yeah, gross margins are, I think around 40 or 50% is what we're forecasting. Uh, don't quote me on that though. They are. Are you expecting a large um, uh, run up sort of in, in advertising expense as, as you're growing at the same time? Or do you have enough pent up demand to where you don't necessarily have to advertise as much? Yeah, so we have, I mean, we've been kind of building this brand for, for four years and working really hard at it. Cause um, you know, that's that's what we love doing is, is building a cool brand that people, like we wanna be a, a company that people line up for and that they go and sell at the supermarket shelves. Uh, right. I think for, for our, so we're not going to, we're not planning on, you know, spending a ton, uh, with our e-commerce model, we've, we've built in kind of an acquisition component. Um, okay. so we, so we pay $60 to acquire a customer or a sale. 
uh, generally their order, they you know, their orders around a hundred dollars or something. Uh, sure. and then, and then we have, and then the idea is that we need to get a certain amount of lifetime value out of that. So hopefully they come back a few times or they subscribe. So they bring in, you know, a couple hundred dollars over their, their, our, our, our relationship with them. But the nice thing is once we have that customer, we have their email, uh, we can tell them about other promotions. We can geo target ads to them. We can really leverage that. And the other thing mm -hmm. is while we're acquiring these customers, we're getting all this other branding and exposure. Um, I saw this just was looking at some stats the other day and it was something like 11 million people in North America have seen our, our ads already on social media, uh -huh. um, which is, which means like once we start getting on grocery stores and shelves, it's not going to be like, Oh, I'm seeing them for the first time. Like, you know, there's that marketing rule of seven, right? You sure. need to see something seven times before you buy it. So we're already in like three, four, five, six, and then that grocery store is going to be the seventh. Um, so we're going to absolutely spend money where it makes sense, where it's smart to do. Um, but we're not planning on just, you know, blowing a, a, a big wad on, on something that doesn't make sense or have a return like, like TV ads or something. Yeah. And, and I imagine with a growing company as well, uh, it, you're going to have a lot of, uh, administrative expenses as well. So I, th I think in 2019, you had more SGNA than you, than you had revenue. What is your 2020 looking like? I haven't seen your 2020 update yet. Yeah, so it's actually coming out in a week, one to two weeks. Um, okay. So the so it's yeah the end of this month was our our deadline for reporting. So we'll have a big annual report letter to shareholders, uh, and then all those updated figures. So I can't I don't think I'm supposed to say anything about them, uh, but I'll send you a link as soon as I've got it. <laughs> uh, it is it is looking very good though. Good good okay. So uh, this facility that you're in now when what's the ramping phase look like for this because uh you know it, it looks mm -hmm. i don't i don't know how big it is but it looks big i mean you got a, what look like a bunch of boxes and stuff i mean i don't know what you got in there weed or or what but mm -hmm. it looks like a lot of stuff and a lot of a lot, you need a lot of people to deal with it mm -hmm. uh, take a while to train and ramp this can you talk to that uh, talk about that a bit yeah so this is just the warehouse um but yeah it's big it's 45,000 square feet sorry mm -hmm. hiccups no worries um, we're in a 4,000 square foot facility before. Um, we've got that kind wow. of, we've got a lot of the staffing in place. I mean, we're, we're running trials every day where we're really starting this, this scale up process. It's absolutely mm -hmm. gonna take, you know, a few months. We've got one line in right now. We're putting another one in, you know, in a couple months. Um, I'd expect, you know, six to 12 months until we're kind of really fully scaled up and, and humming along. Um, wow. just, to, just to quickly touch on capacity, I think we've announced it's going to be once scaled up, you know, 37 million pounds annually. Um, so it's going to be capable of doing 100 million plus uh, in revenue out of this facility, uh, which is, you know, significant amount more from where we are currently. Um, so we're really excited to, yeah, to be scaling up here. Uh, it's going to take, you know, a lot of time at work, but we've started it. Like all our tests are looking great. We may even be able to to shave off time and even gain further efficiencies. Uh, so we're really excited at, at the uh, the results we've seen so far. Now, uh, have you noticed, uh, I, I know you had that COVID transition, but it, just here in f between December and April, ha have you noticed any uh, slowdown in, in trends? Are, are people eating, ordering food less because maybe restaurants are opening? Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't mm -hmm. dove in too much into the data. And like, cause we kind of have a, we produce product and then a week or less later, it's sold and gone and out the door. Uh, and it's well, been you're like still that selling since... out of that the smaller facility, right? Yeah, now, for right the... now. It's... Okay, okay, okay. Exactly. So, like our online sales, um, I, I'm not sure if if because they're not really dropping off. That we're you know we're we're gaining and finding new customers. Uh, grocery store sales remain you know steady, and if we have any excess capacity, we'll open up another ten stores and and you know open those points of distribution. Right. Um, I think I think it's kind of here to stay. I mean, yes, there'll be some drop off. People order online a little bit less. They'll go out to restaurants. I'm I'm really hoping it all opens up because we we'd love to start getting more into food service as well. Uh, so like doing a doing a steak for for a company like the Keg or one of those those large food service chains. So that's absolutely what part does of that mean? part of. Yeah. So you know, there as restaurants open up, um, yeah. there's opportunities to to put food into the restaurants, right? Um, so, so you know, so like getting into the kitchens of of restaurants, basically. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. Having your very steak on, on like a, I don't know, like an olive garden menu, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. So we're really excited to start looking at that as, as food. Mm. So I don't think it'll be, it'll be like that kind of juggling as, as I, as I said mm. before. So if mm -hmm. anything does go down, we're going to have, you know, food service partnerships are going to go up or a restaurant sales will I go see. up. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so in the event website sales decline, hey, you're optimistic about look, re restaurant reopenings aren't just good for the consumer. Sure, maybe they'll order less online, yeah. but it's also good for us because maybe that'll be a partner for us. Have you partnered with with restaurants before, or how, how does that work? Yeah, we have uh, on a limited scale, just because we've been kind of production limited. There's some different sure. requirements in terms of how they're packaged. Uh, I want to say we're in maybe you know ten or fifteen kind of local restaurants here in the area, um, but we'd love to to establish relationships with some kind of larger chains uh, as sure. we have, have, have production capacity to fill. We, we need the, the very steak at McDonald's <laughs> to compete with. <laughs> but I don't know if you would want to because you had mentioned you're like a premium bread. It almost seemed like you were kind mm. of suggesting maybe, maybe you're more like a Chick-fil-A than a McDonald's. <laughs> maybe you can clarify on that. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, I don't necessarily see ourselves in like mainstream fast food. You know, okay. maybe we've, we've got this thing called a taco stuffer. It's really good. Maybe at a Chipotle or something. Um, okay. I, or, you know, there's all those, and then there's all those bigger kind of ch like fast, casual, mid range chain restaurants that have like, you know, 20 to 200 restaurants across the country or across North America. I could yeah. see ourselves partnering with them on some of our more unique offerings, hmm. uh, like our, our, yeah, steak hit up Red or, Robin. our ribs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, that's that's uh, yeah because Red Robin they they always preach uh, the the premium burger is 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 their mm. thing so that's uh, that that could be interesting uh, and mm. I'm sure I'm sure they'd love uh, love a little bit of a, a spice up they've got some really good fries I don't know if you have them in Canada do you we have one here in Victoria I've never been actually I got I'm gonna oh. go when I'm back in Victoria I'll check it out. See, now you got to go get the guacamole yeah. bacon burger. <laughs> there you go. So, um, and, and I, I, I don't know if you eat meat given that you're, you're working at a plant-based company. So I'm sorry if you don't. I, I don't, but I think they, uh, I'm sure they have something for me. I'm sure. So 37 million pounds of, of, uh, meat, uh, meet quote unquote annually mm. as, as a potential goal, which you think could be a hundred million dollars in revenue. It, what, I mean, like how, that to me, well, let me ask you, how many pounds of meat have you done in 2020? Yeah, I don't know if I can share that exact number because you can kind of. Oh, yeah, then maybe go to, go to 19. That's um, fine. Uh, yeah, so we had our, and I'm also getting, so we had our Victoria production facility. Uh, as I mentioned, once it was fully scaled up, it was, it can do around 9,000 kilograms. So now we're in kilograms, the whole Canadian US thing. I think around, you know, 15 to 15 to 20,000 pounds a week. Okay. Uh, so a significantly lower amount. So maybe we're maxing out at, you know, 75 to 100, 100,000 pounds uh, per month. Right, right. So somewhere around 800, 900,000 annually. So under a mil. How, how are you going to 37 X that because you know, if you're, yeah. you're around a million pounds, how do you go from a million pounds to, to 37 million pounds? Is it mm -hmm. just this one facility? Yeah. So oh. how do we make it or how do we sell it? Or, or do you want both? No. How, how do you, how, how do you get the production capacity to go from, mm -hmm. from, you know, 1 million to, 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 to 37 million? Yeah. So it is, you know, large scale manufacturing equipment. Um, so as I mentioned before, the Victoria production facility, it is, quite labor intensive, you know, there's a lot of people working at, and these are like, at the time they were the the best kind of machines that we could buy, let's say like a 50 to a hundred thousand dollar sausage stuffer, but you need to kind of throw the stuff in the top. And actually for the first two years, we were rolling sausages by hand and you can imagine how inefficient wow. that is. But yeah. so you, you feed the sausage stuffer and then it shoots out sausages and there's still a manual process for steaming and packaging. So then let's let's say you're gonna let's jump up, let's get a, a million dollar sausage stuffer and think of what that's gonna look like. Much bigger hopper, you've got an automated thing that dumps in, you have these huge automated kettles that are cooking this stuff, processing it, and you have a production line that is able to to put out fifty you know, a thousand to fifteen hundred kilograms. Sorry, we're doing this math no, conversion right. thing again, uh, but per hour. Um so that's what we're kind of targeting this this like hourly. This yeah. We, <laughs> it's not the one we've got is a little, and Victoria is a bit better than that, but that's like kind of, yeah, that's that, like that kind of style. Like maybe, maybe something that looks more like, like these kind of things because you're talking yeah. about these. Okay. 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 Something like that. We've got a, a slightly bigger one in Victoria, but it can do, yeah, I don't know what the, the throughput is and I'm not the expert on that, but let's say Victoria sure. is doing 50, 50 or less, you know, and this one kilogram looks big. an hour. Yeah, something like that looks pretty similar to what we have. Oh, okay, okay, um, okay, gotcha. But then you you get something in here. We're actually going to be putting out a video next week with a little tour of the production facility, so you'll be able to see this equ equipment and kind of try and 
piece together how, how, but it's basically having more space, having industrial level, like having a, a full warehouse with where we're bringing pallets of everything and shipping it out. Um, yeah, my, I mean, my background is not operations and production, so I, I'm doing my best to, to paint a picture for you. No, 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 no worries. No worries. Okay. So, so really it's because you're going from this, this 4,000 square mm -hmm. foot facility where or originally you were doing a lot of stuff by hand. Maybe mm -hmm. you had some machines, but they've got nowhere near the capacity of what you expect by going to this now 40 plus thousand square foot facility, mm -hmm. which is 10 times the size. And yeah. in this, you're going to have and maybe not a hundred thousand dollar sausage stuffer, but a what five hundred thousand dollar sausage stuffer, or what? Yeah, something like that. A, a okay, bigger, okay. more expensive, and it can you know it can operate, it can process you know ten times the speed, or and like m much more flow through, okay. and like this thing just sh shoots the sausages out, and then you have you know you tie in like maybe some aut an automated packaging line to it, so you don't have I someone see. by hand. So like right now in Victoria, we have someone we have the label so they pop open the box they put the four sausages in they put it in a box so we'll have a machine that does that there's all these these opportunities to save steps and labor if you can afford to pay for the equipment and to get it installed mm -hmm. so that's how going public has really has really helped us it's given us easy access to capital so we can do this scale up um because yeah. we i mean we, we're pretty sure the demands there we've, we've got the product market fit we've proven that out over the years uh and we're really ready to kind of scale this and get it out there. And we've got the, you know, the stores waiting for us. Wow. Wow. That's, that's incredible. So uh, yeah, uh, touch on maybe these, these partnerships, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen on some of your presentations, uh, the reference to like Whole Foods and some other companies, how many Whole Foods are you in? Yeah, <laughs> good question. So right now, uh, so Whole Foods isn't that as big in Canada. There's about six Whole Foods in BC. Um, we're, we're in all of them. I mean, we're we're selling, you know, over the summer, we're selling 100 plus cases a week, which is a lot. Um, I can't announce anything about our U.S. partnerships yet. Uh, we'll be announcing mm -hmm. them as as we're able to. Uh, sure. I can say we, we've sold great in the Whole Foods here in Canada. Uh, I believe we're, we're expanding to the Whole Foods in Eastern Canada. And we, we'd love to expand to the ones in the U.S. as well. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. what it looks like is this facility gets online in the next kind of, you know, fully scale up in the next month or so. Uh, and then we start shipping product south. Um, so right now we're just kind of on the west coast of Canada. So BC, Alberta, and then a little bit in central Canada. Um, yeah. So we really need this facility to be fully operational so that we can open up the rest of those stores. Um, gotcha. As an example, we're in you know 300 plus stores now. Um, yeah. By the end of the year, I'm sure we'll we'll be in you know two, three, four thousand plus stores. Uh, and so what do you, what's your expectation in terms of the split between store sales and, and online? And I know everything's been distorted with COVID here. So maybe yeah. you can kind of speak to that broadly. Yeah. So, I mean, traditionally it kind of depended on the month and, you know, e-commerce was very strong for us, maybe up to 50%. Uh, I think long-term there's just so much volume in grocery stores. Um, I think it's going to shift and like, you know, maybe 20, we'll have 20% online you know, 80% in store, or sorry, 80% grocery store, and then, you know, 5% of our own brick and mortar. I know that gets 105%. So that's oh, how, that's how good we're going to be. <laughs> um, so I think, but I think e-commerce is still growing. It's, it's going to be a huge part of our business. Uh, we love having that direct relationship with the consumers. Because, um, you know, you're on a grocery store shelf, you're kind of at the mercy of the grocery store. They decide they don't like you one day or they like something else. You're on a bad shelf. Your customers can't find you. With that e-commerce relationship, we can really build a connection with them. We, you know, ship them a monthly subscription. We give them recipes. I just really, yeah, love having that that back and forth and that owning that relationship. Yeah, I mean, so really, it it sounds like uh, I mean, stores are going to be the the big driver here, especially as as things continue to reopen with mm -hmm. COVID. Do you ever expect that balance to shift? I mean, do you ever expect it to get to fifty fifty, or is that not the priority? The priority is really let's just let's get production and get in as many stores as possible. Yeah, so I think it'll shift to to eighty twenty, so eighty percent grocery stores and rest. You know, oh, that's that's stores. long. Sorry, okay, okay. That's I long thought, term. I thought that was now. Gotcha. Oh yeah, okay. so now now it's like maybe more fifty fifty, but I think yeah, oh, long term oh. absolutely because there's gotcha. just so there's just so many. You know, every every mm -hmm. city has every small town has five five grocery stores. So sure, okay, yeah. okay, got it's, it. Okay, you, I mean, you can you can sell a lot online, but I don't think you can sell that much. 
Gotcha, got it. Long term, eighty uh, percent store. I I do like uh, the the potential though of this the subscription model. Uh, it, I mean, how is that? What's the churn like on that? You know, with with food, oftentimes we can see a little bit of a, you know, we see fads like Blue Apron was hit for like it was the hit for for a few years. Nobody talks about Blue Apron anymore. Now it's like, oh, it's a HelloFresh, and you know that's going to go through mm. its cycle as well. Is is it that a risk factor? Yeah. And I mean, that's why we're not just putting all our eggs in one basket and just building a, a vegan meat subscription company. Um, yeah. But I think, I mean, we had some, so, so we've been doing it for a few years now. We've kind of learned a lot. We've done different campaigns. We've had, we've got a few thousand subscribers. Um, what we found is it was when we were like in the summer, we had actually up a, a six wait, a six week wait for orders because we we're so production backlog because we had so many orders. Uh, so that's not great for churn, right? Someone's waiting six weeks and then they're the second box is showing up. It just, so that wasn't great. So, and at the same time we were building out the logistics network to be able to handle thousands of orders a week. Uh, we've since built that out and things are looking really good in terms of the, 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 the box economics in terms of churn. Um, and even if they're, they don't end up subscribing for, you know, six months or whatever, we're yeah. pretty confident that they're still going to remain engaged. So maybe, they're not getting every every month, but they're, they'll come back when we do a Black Friday sale. They'll come back for you know stock up for Thanksgiving or for grilling mm -hmm. season. We're we're not saying goodbye. We're going to see them again, and if they don't, pretty soon their local neighborhood store is going to have our products there, and they can just pick up one package instead of buying the the fifty or the hundred dollar box. Um, so we really see it as yeah as as one piece of our overall business, and the subscription box is driving grocery store sales. And our, our butcher shops are, they're all kind of supporting each other. And we're trying to build a, well, I guess a company behind that. Sure. Sure. No, that makes sense. Now what, what's the churn been like on that, that 2000? Yeah. So it's gone through, through phases. Like, um, over the summer it was, it was pretty bad. Like, you know, when, when there was a six week wait, um, so our numbers sure. were going down. Um, recently it's been good. I mean, I, 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 can't remember it off the top of my head, um, but I'll make sure we we try and get it in the annual report if we can. Sure thing. So, what about okay? So, store competitiveness. I want to I want to know more about store competitiveness. How do you compete uh, against uh, you, you know all of the products that exist? I mean, if you're in Whole mm -hmm. Foods, you're going to be competing against the 365 stuff. Like, I, and I'm mm -hmm. sure they've got to have like a 365 vegan burger or something. I I don't know. I've never looked, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure they've got to have one. Here, plant based burgers, 4H, 365. You know how how do you guys compete against this? Because if it's price, mm. then you're in a price war. Or or are you guys this? Or or can you become the 365 and just private label with them? Yeah, so we're not not super interested in private label. I don't think we want to. We don't want to compete uh, with uh, compete on brands with price or buy compete with price. There we go. What we're trying to do is we're trying to kind of almost build a a lifestyle brand, uh, a a company that people like with a range of products that they enjoy so that people are going to the store looking for the very good butchers products. Um, mm. The nice thing we've got is that when, when, when we launch in a new market, we've already got, you know, all our online customers. We have a database of people in that area who've, who have went to our website or visited our, or bought our products before. So we can send them a little targeted message saying, Hey, whole foods in Ontario just got the product, you know, go check it out there. So that's kind of a, a, a a bonus we have so we can support our, our, our grocery store sales with kind of our other digital marketing efforts. Gotcha. And, and that's kind of goes along with what you were saying earlier too, with you're trying to be that, that premium uh, retailer essentially of, mm -hmm. or, or premium provider uh, of mm -hmm. these uh, plant-based meats. So maybe, maybe it's not so much of a competitiveness on price. It's uh, Hey, we want to be the best quality, huh? Yeah. So the best quality, the best taste, the best kind of selection, um, yeah, we don't want to, yeah, just be next to the uh, five other, you know, burger and sausage brands. We want to be, we want to be different. We want to be unique. And a, a big piece of that is why we're doing it as, as the butchers. Cause that's something, you know, a little bit different. Do you know who's white labeling this stuff? The 365 stuff or private labeling? I, their burgers. I don't know. No. That, that'd be interesting to know if there, if there was something we could figure out. Uh, wait, hold on. So, oh, that's certified kosher. Okay. That's, that's just telling us which company sort of did the certification there. Yeah. That's, I always think it's interesting to know who's, yeah. who's doing it behind the scenes. Like who's yeah. doing those Archer farms nuts at target. Although you guys don't like target in Canada, like your targets in Canada kind of suck. I hate, I mean, not to be offensive, but have you, have you, yeah. found that 
<laughs> we had we had a target and then I think Walmart took it over. I'm not yeah. really really sure. I mean our our strategy is to kind of because I think it's hard if you start in Target and Walmart and Sam's Club and then you try to go not backwards but then you try to go into Whole Foods. So we're kind of ah. starting in we're starting in natural uh Whole Foods like kind of where I think our our ideal customer is they're a bit bit less price sensitive. They're looking mm. for unique different products and then once you're well established in that natural they kind of call it the natural channel uh it's you can kind of move into the, the big box stores and the volume stores um yeah. i've seen i from what i hear it's challenging to do it the other way because all of a sudden whole foods is like you know where else are you oh we're at a, a target and walmart and widely available everywhere for much cheaper than you're going to sell it for it's kind of oh. like a oh you know it makes it makes that piece of it a bit trickier um but that isn't to say we're not going to be in, in target and walmart you know one of these days but I think we'd have to to see how it how it fits with our overall kind of strategy. Yeah, that's uh, that is fascinating. So really, if you want to go premium, uh, you get into Whole Foods, you get in uh, in a premium direction. Yeah. You better not be in those, uh, uh, you know, the the Costco's and the Sam's Club, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. So yeah. uh, competition wise, you're you're not so worried. You're trying to build that brand, but building a brand can oftentimes take a whole lot of advertising energy, which I know you had mentioned you got those 11 million impressions. Uh, it, it, do you see, uh, as you do these these 37 million pounds here, potentially a, a massive advertising push? And, and what's your choice, TV commercials, internet? Yeah, um, I think, so we've been, I think we, I mean, we've done a good job. Like initially we, we built the brand with with no advertising money or marketing budget because we didn't have one. So we're on social sure. media. You know, we've got you know sixty thousand on Instagram, about the same on Facebook. We built a pretty good following. I don't think it's going to look like TV. It's going to look like influencer marketing, uh, unboxing, interesting mm -hmm. YouTube. Like we've got this Instagram video series with Jack the Bean Wrangler. So kind of like <laughs> guerrilla marketing. We're going to get a food truck on the road. I'm sorry, I'm giving away all my genius marketing ideas. Darn. <laughs> well, uh, but I think we're going to really see, and we're going to see what works. If this works. Uh, then we're going to double down on it. Like we're not afraid to spend money on marketing and, and brand building, but it has yeah. to be done smartly. There has to be a measurable ROI. Like we, we're not just going to kind of spray and pray. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Those are so I actually like that strategy. I mean, uh, it, you could spend millions of dollars on producing TV commercials and then airing them, but then how do you track? Uh, you know, there's no there's no link you track off a TV no. commercial. You know, so so that's that's not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the nice thing is we also we can tie in our e-commerce as well, and you can pretty quickly see. Okay, I spent a hundred dollars and it brought in three hundred dollars in sales, or it only brought in a hundred dollars in sales, but all these other people saw the ad and maybe they're going to buy it at the grocery store. So you have all that data and you can kind of try and use that to guide the, the right decisions and, and allocate right. money in the right, the right places. How are you finding hiring right now? Has that been difficult for the company with, uh, you know, with, with COVID the way it has mm -hmm. been? Yeah. So, I mean, the nice thing is Vancouver is kind of like plant-based food hub of Canada. Uh, so you've had a few big companies come out of here, like, you know, day of foods, Vega, Gardein, uh, so, so getting those people experienced in the sector who've been there, done that, bought the postcard or, you know, whatever the saying is, uh, is good. It is challenging to, to hire people in like for the production floor and people are a bit kind of scared about going back to work. Um, but we've, you we are have noticing that some people, I mean, like Victoria, for example, where, uh, I'm from and where our production facility is it just a completely different labor market, uh, driven, you know, there's a lot of restaurants and stuff there, a lot of students. Um, we haven't really had a, a, a huge difficulties. I mean, we're paying, you know, we're, we're paying a, a good wage. We're offering benefits. We're trying to be a, a good company and a good place to work. Uh, mm -hmm. but I think it, in hiring people, no matter what you're doing is, is, is still challenging. And there's, you know, of course. it's a whole host of, uh, you know, things to, to think about and to deal with. Well, growing pains, right? I mean, how many employees exactly. do you have now and, and what are you trying to get to at the end of the year to actually get to your 37 mil production? Yeah. So this was a, a kind of scary not scary, but like an eye-opening fact. So I looked yeah. at this re report. So la at the beginning of last year, we were at around 30 people or so. By the end of the year, so end of 2020, we were at just over 100. Um, wow. So that's in a year, you know, three or four Xing, which is pretty nuts. Um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what we're, we're forecasting for hiring. I think we're maybe maybe we're at around 150 now, looking to add, you know, so, some more to finish this scale up. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be <laughs> a big company. You get to a point where you can't, you know, you can't 
have that, like in the startup phase, right? You, you know everyone, you're working close together. Um, so it's just how do we take that and as a, a larger company still have that lean startup scrappy mentality, you know, making good products, getting them out quickly, innovating, uh, and just, you know, kicking ass and taking names. Yeah, absolutely. Who's Pontos? I hear they do plant-based proteins with like lentils or something. What, what's that all about? Good question. Yeah, they're out of Vancouver as well. Um, so plant-based protein, water lentils. I don't know a lot about it. So we took a look mm. at it, you know, quite early on to evaluate as a protein source. And for mm. us, it, it was a no-go because, so they have these water lentils that they're growing and then there's these ponds and then there's fish in the ponds that are eating the lentils or like shitting and sorry. I don't know, and like, <laughs> you know, growing this, this whole circle of life thing. So for us as like a hundred percent vegan, uh, plant-based company, we couldn't use that because it was, you know, there's still animals involved and maybe they're just swimming around and being happy, but at the same time, you know, you are kind of using these animals. Um, right. <laughs> so that's, so we didn't learn much more about their protein source. Uh, they've got a right. sweet ticker though. It's Hulk, which I thought was yeah. pretty cool. And it's great. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a good one. So, uh, okay. So protein source, yours is, is mostly black beans or, or, and where are you getting them from? Yeah, so it depends on uh, the the product. So we use black beans, kidney beans, adzuki beans, which are a red bean. Uh, so it really depends on the product. Uh, wheat gluten has a lot of protein in it as well. Um, obviously, not a lot of beans growing on the west coast of Canada here. Uh, so we look at the prairies is where we get like a Saskatchewan, Manitoba, a lot of our beans. Um, and yeah, and we found as we are are growing, it's, it's, it is definitely challenging to the supply chain. Like you have to start contacting farmers and buying their year's supply of beans or veggies and, you know, figuring all those pieces out. Um, so we've got, a, yeah, got a really, a really good supply chain team working on that. Gotcha. Gotcha. What about, uh, you know, this, this 37 million goal of, of pounds of production mm -hmm. here in, uh, in, in 2021 or, or whenever you reach that full capacity, when do you think you'll exceed that? I mean, if, if uh, your advertising mm -hmm. campaign goes well, are you already thinking, uh oh, we might have to get to the point of the next facility? Yeah, so we're uh, we're one step ahead. So we've got a facility in California um, okay. that was similar to this one. It was so we've signed a lease on it. It was made doing food production before, so it's kind of ready to go. Yes, you need to install equipment, get lines up and running, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we've got that kind of ready to go. We're going to get, be getting that up and running towards the end of this year. Um, wow. And the big thing Where's for us that? was just, it's in Patterson, California. So the big thing for us was right now, so we make our product in Victoria. We then ship it down to, uh, to, to Patterson, California, to around there. Uh, and then our third-party logistics provider, so we ship them pallets. They will then pack up our e-commerce boxes and send it out via two-day ground to anyone west of the Rockies. Um, wow. So we're, we're racking up freight, sending stuff down there. At the same time, some of our produce is coming from like about 45 minutes from there. Uh, mm -hmm. So it really made sense to be manufacturing there, especially for the U.S. market. You kind of long term, you want to be making in the U.S. Um, so that it is this production facility will have the inputs there. It'll make it. Then they'll put it on a forklift, run it over next door to our logistics provider, as opposed to ship it by, you know, two or three day truck. Um, right. so, so, yeah, it just made sense on a, a lot of different levels. Uh, and that's going to be more than 37 million pounds uh is the goal uh, it's going to take you know we start commissioning towards the end of the year there's a scale-up process etc um but the idea is those two are going to be able to, to feed north america and beyond oh my gosh so uh, most of your raw materials now you're not getting them immediately from your area that's why you see this benefit in this patterson facility this patterson facility how large is that one going to be you know we want to mm. I mean, you'll, you'll potentially be able to, it sounds like maybe even double your 37 million, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's 25,000 mm -hmm. square feet and mm -hmm. then we've got a 25,000 square feet right of first refusal. So it can basically oh, wow. double in size. It's a much cleaner design than the facility here. Here there's a bunch of kind of walls and little weird rooms, sure. much more open. And they've also got like half a million plus of, of freezer storage, like next door as part of the same complex that we can utilize. Mm -hmm. Um, so with a lot of our products we'll produce and then we'll we'll freeze it uh, for to go out by e-commerce or, or the grocery stores. Um, so that yeah, that'll be you know probably you know more production capacity than this facility here in Vancouver. As you're trying to expand right now, are you noticing any resistance from from uh, grocery stores to to shelf you or, or to put your product up or or are they charging you large fees to get on you know in, in a premium spot? Yeah, so 
we've, uh, I mean, we've had basically had been collecting a waiting list since day one of grocery stores that want to take our product, but we were not ready for them. Mm. Uh, so it's, so it's been really nice. Like them, you know, them coming to us, like, uh, the other day, this, the, uh, like one of the VPs of the second largest grocery chain in, in, uh, Canada messaged me on LinkedIn and I told someone, I was like, wow, those guys never reach out. Like you have to pound them. Uh, so the exciting thing is like plant-based meat, it's just growing like crazy. Retailers want more plant-based products. I don't think we've we've ever paid a listing fee, maybe like a small one, like a hundred bucks a, a skew or something. Uh, so I haven't ha encountered big listing okay. fees yet. I think I think we will as we scale and we get into those bigger box stores. Um, but we're always negotiating. We're saying, hey, we're a small startup. You know, we have all these followers online. Like, just list it for free, and you'll thank us later. Um, so yeah, ton of interest from retailers. Um, which has been really, yeah, really great and nice and something I think we just were kind of lucky in terms of the space, in terms of the, the product quality and how it looks on shelf. Uh, from mm -hmm. what I hear, that's not normally the case. Like I know a lot of other people in food and they're like, yeah, we always have to, to hound these these reps to get placements and stuff. Yeah. Uh, for us, it's, it's almost been the other way around, which has been really nice. And, and is that true in mostly your local area? Or are you seeing that also be true as you kind of expand out? Yeah, no, I'd say it's true across north america like we have those kind of stories yeah across the north america and you said I mean, the sec oh sorry i was gonna say we do i mean yes we have a bit of a home court advantage if we're here in bc because sure. everyone's heard of us but i think it's gonna it's it's gonna prove itself out because we're already servicing these areas by our e-commerce as well right so we're building up that customer base getting that brand awareness gotcha Got it. Uh, okay, so second largest uh, uh, retailer in Canada is, is at uh, LCBL out of Ontario. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the liquor control board. Yeah, <laughs> Where I'm spending no. my money. <laughs> uh, okay, so no, that's that's awesome. I, I like to hear that. All right, so uh, what would you say the differences in in margins between online and uh, in, and uh, the grocery stores? You've already kind of mentioned that. Online, you have that direct relationship. It could be a little less expensive. Can you give us a guide on on how much less expensive? Yeah. So you sell, let's say you sell directly online, mm -hmm. and there's no acquisition cost. Like this is someone you've added them to your email list. We've got a large email list, but let's say or they're your customer or whatever. So you're gonna we're gonna get at least seventy percent of okay. they spend a hundred bucks. We're getting you know seventy uh, after the the cost of you know making the product and a little bit for. You know, they pay for shipping, but maybe we'll give them a bit of a dis a five percent discount or there's some packaging fees and stuff. So yeah, seventy percent. Uh traditional grocery store retail, you know, you'll be lucky to get, you know, fifty percent. Gotcha. Because there, there's the distributor, there's the retailer, there's the broker, there's you know, everybody taking a cut. Uh yeah. you know, 40, 40 to fifty. It really depends on a number of factors. Um, and that's that's your gross uh, margin there. What what are you all thinking is, is going to be a, a consistent kind of net? I mean, generally, when we think of food, we think of lower, right? Because then mm -hmm. you get a factor in your advertising and all that. Um, 5, 10, 15? Yeah, I think we can I – mean, I don't want to just to give too much guidance, but I think we can go on the higher end because we have – we're not just in the big box stores who grind out and take all of your margin. I mean, I think for the next, so I think, yeah, 15, 20, um, I think for the next year or two, like we're, we're laser focused on growth. Uh, yeah. so growing distribution, growing rev, you know, so we're, we will absolutely be spending more on marketing and, and building awareness and capturing a big piece of the pie and getting all those customer relationships. Cause we're not just going to be selling them meat. Like we want to, we're expanding into other verticals. We just acquired a cheese company. So we're going to be selling the meat, cheese, milks, you know, a whole kind of basket of products for the rest of their lives maybe <laughs> so right wow, now we're just wow. we're we're focused on on yeah on, on growth but sustainable growth well what's this this cheese thing i, I did hear i did want to bring that up uh because I, I heard that was also something that now now you're thinking about doing like plant-based cheese or something or yeah so the reason we ipo is a very good food company is we didn't want to just be pigeonholed into the uh plant-based meats um, we, we saw a lot of opportunity in, in other sectors, like they're all kind of, you know, growing and, and interesting. Uh, so we acquired a, a local cheese company called the cultured nut, uh, out of Victoria. Uh, we'll be rebranding as a very good cheese company. Uh, we worked closely with them for years. We sell, you know, a ton of their product online. Uh, it's the, the best plant-based cheese I've tasted. It's kind of an artisan cashew based, just really good. Obviously meat and cheese go great together, you know, on, on pizzas, sure. sandwiches, charcuterie boards. So it just kind of was a logical fit. 
Um, so that was our kind of our first M and A, our first acquisition. We are like long term. We'd love to have a family of brands. You know, maybe fifteen uh, plant based brands with high quality products with ethics, and basically leverage all these things we're developing to support and and grow and build these brands. So mm -hmm. let's say we want to go to Europe. Let's set up a manufacturing facility in Europe. We'll do meat there. We'll do cheese there. We've got a another brand as well, uh, and we'll kind of use all these shared resources because I think one thing we've found while building all this out is that it's hard. And like, if you're just a food entrepreneur on your own, trying to scale up and grow a business, it's really tough. So we're really hoping that we can leverage these kind of share resources to help, to help other people grow as well. Gotcha. Now this, um, you had mentioned that there are 11 million folks had seen your advertising. Was that, was that for the website? And, and when was that? Was that like uh, January la end of last year, like Thanksgiving time for America or, or when was that? Yeah, so that was it was over. I want to say a six month or a year period, mm -hmm. um, okay. and it was it was specifically related to our our e commerce acquisition efforts. I, I guess nice. so us trying to acquire and because that, then it's not just oh it's brand awareness because I mean you can give you can give Google as much money as you want per month and they'll show it to as many people, uh, but we were tied that specifically to our e commerce so it it made sense in terms of you know the in terms of our, I guess our our business model. Um, but an added benefit was that we had those 11 people, 11 million people that had been exposed to the brand as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wh when can somebody buy your product with like Bitcoin or Dogecoin? That is a good question. I was looking at this Shopify integration app thing the other day for it. Didn't yeah. click install, so I'm not sure yet. But uh, you know what? I'll, I'll look into it. Okay, got it. Why, why Shopify over Square? Yeah, so for us, I mean, I think Shopify is, is kind of best in class, especially, you know, four years ago when we set it up, Square didn't even, Square was more like the Square thing on the food truck at the, sure. the thing. They've yeah. since built out a bit more infrastructure behind it. Um, but yeah, Shopify was just kind of, I used it kind of in the past. I was familiar with it. And uh, yeah, that's why we still use Square for our um, our food truck, I think as a Square tablet oh, wow. and terminal. Um, but yeah. Yeah, because they talk about having the uh, the omni channel where they can kind of combine inventories from that. But I imagine the food truck has probably got to be a fraction of a percent of your sales, and it's it's not a priority. Huh? Yeah, for us, it's more of a, a marketing branding tool. I mean, yes, before yeah. COVID, we take it to big festivals, and it would bring in like 10k a day, which at the time we thought you know was pretty awesome, and it still is awesome. Sure. But for us, it's more about getting product out there, getting people to taste it, have that really good experience, and then hopefully turning them into a customer for you know for life. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Anything I've missed? Like what, what are some other questions you usually get on asked that, that I haven't asked here? This has actually been good. It's been, uh, it's been thorough. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I think you, you, you covered a lot of them. Um, I guess in terms of our, our long-term vision, I could chat about that a little bit. Sure. Um, go for it. I mean, we want to be a global brand. A big focus this year is on North America. You know, we're looking at Europe and APAC as the next kind of big areas for expansion. Oh, wow. Um, and yeah, we want to get into other verticals as well. You know, plant-based dairy, uh, sauces, ready to eat meals, the whole kind of spectrum. And, and uh, eventually we want to basically someone, you know, to go into someone's fridge or their pantry and uh, take every kind of animal-based food there and replace it with a, a healthier, tastier plant-based version. So that's kind of our, our goal wow. or our mission as the very good food company. Oh, thank you for that. Are, are you seeing uh, folks in, in Asia or Europe wanting plant-based as much as in North America? I mean, I'm uh, having trouble with the, you know, the Germans giving up the bratwurst, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So actually, so Europe is kind of a few years ahead of North America in terms of really consumer appetites, trends, the three biggest companies, sorry, countries in Europe, uh, Germany, surprisingly. Wow. Uh, Holland. So the Netherlands and then the UK is like the top in the world. Uh, and it's funny because a lot of our equipment in this production facility here is from Germany because they have that meat making culture. They're experts at it. Like they had our a German Fleischer master come over here and, and help us get everything set up. And yes, it's plant based, but the, a lot of the techniques and stuff are the same. It's just a bit of a different consistency and process. Wow. Wow. That's uh, that's incredible. Uh, that that is something new. I did not know that. I know, right? uh, very very cool. Uh, cool. Okay, geez. Well, this has been super exciting, exciting and insightful. Uh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely incredible. Uh, how how can people order from you? What should they go do? Yeah. So verygoodbutchers.com. Uh, we have meat boxes. We have subscription. We ship across North America. Uh, I guess you're kind of 
investor focus as well. So you can find us on uh, the Toronto Venture Exchange. Ticker symbol is Barry.V. Uh, on the OTC markets, it's VRYYF. Uh, I think we have a European symbol as well. I'm not sure exactly what it is uh, for any of your European viewers. <laughs> um, and yeah. Oh, you just flashed it up there. Nice. There we go. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you cool. so very much. Uh, this has been a blast. I really appreciate it. Stand by for one moment for everybody watching. If you found this helpful, consider sharing the video, like, subscribe, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks.